Seguimos luchando, lloviendo, marchando. Seguimos luchando, lloviendo, marchando. Seguimos luchando, lloviendo, marchando. Seguimos luchando. painted on, not to separate. That is my concept of what a wall is for. I've got people who've been here since they were days old and who are now being told, if you don't like it, leave. This is their country. How would I feel if my mom or my dad would be deported? The thing that I believe puts us back together is understanding. It's important for all of us, especially for them, to understand that. That you are looking at yourself through the eyes of a more dominant majority. And in this case, I was looking at myself through the eyes of white America. For each of you, what's lost may be different. It may be a, a loss of security for yourself or family members, a loss of social standing. Um, you might feel a loss of safety or a loss of what you thought were shared values that you didn't know could be lost. The California State Legislature that just opened up with its strongest stance on immigration, on environment, on a whole host of issues, and we just didn't have that really before this. Because we cannot afford to take democracy for granted. Now is the time that we also must demonstrate civil courage and protect those that cannot, who cannot protect themselves, and that goes for the environment as well. Each one of you have a right to education. We are here to provide you the skills that you need to go on. But we're also here to make you feel safe and that our college is a safe haven for you. The college has the utmost respect for student privacy rights and your rights to see your records uh, and, their, and our responsibility to protect those rights. For a long time, states' rights and local rights have been the concern and the arguments of the right, and now you've got the left making those arguments, it's going to be interesting to see how the right reacts to some of those arguments, frankly, if they're going to actually heed to their own arguments now that they're being pitched by the other side, or if they're just going to, you know, um, try to shut them down. First, I would like to start with our fearless and hardest working President Martinez, who works day and night for her, for her students and for the college. A person who grew up in East Los Angeles, whose family came from immigrants. My father's family came from Mexico. My mother's family was from, really, from Michigan, but moved to Arizona and lived on a border town. My mother's family was, she was one of 10 children and my father was one of six. My mother brought her family to Hollywood. They lived here and she brought her sister. She was one of the top three in terms of ages. And my father was one of six, as I said. His mother was a stay-at-home mother, and my grandfather worked in on the railroad. But some of the things that I feel that I learned throughout my life was there were times that you could speak your second language, and there were times that you were not. We learned very early to speak Spanish in the house. 
I want to introduce legendary Gronk. We are so uh, thrilled to have him here, and this comes via Daniel Marlos. Thank you, Daniel. He's been a, a true artist and activist for decades. I don't have the answers to the world's problems, nor do I try to solve it in my work. I'm just an observer of my particular moment in time, and I want to share those observations. Another large-scale drop. It's about a border, just like we have. No place an importance on a cup or a coffee sleeve. I do. I like the kind of things that are daily, that most people disregard and think unimportant. Those are the things I gravitate to as an artist. So what happens with these drops, they ended up traveling to, uh, to Spain. So I labeled each one of the crates, the Nina, the Pinta, the Santa Maria. <laughs> So it actually went back to its original <laughs> That's part of the set for the opera by Purcell that opened in Perm, it went to Madrid, it went to London, and then back to Moscow. No bookings here in the United States. I do things with music as well. This is what the Germans said about people that they were taking away. First it was evacuate, then it was called resettlement because the language kept on changing and then it was called deportation. So they changed the language to accommodate their ideas. How would I feel if someone yelled Trump, Trump, Trump and blocked me from entering the classroom, the place in which I'm supposed to be able to build my intellect and share my knowledge? The immigration comes and they say, what's in your bag? And I said, well, uh, British uh, Vogue magazine, because I'm in it. Uh, Glamour magazine, because I'm in it. Because I had to take all these publications for the host on the TV show to go through and ask me questions on the talk show. So uh, they went into another room. They come out maybe about a half hour later, and they say, get out of here. My bus had left. I'm there waiting for the next Greyhound bus. Couldn't go back to my studio, so I had to go to the airport immediately as soon as I got back in. Yet the uh, next place that I go to is a museum show. And of course, there's the mayor of the city, the governor of the city, and they're all saying to you and all the artists that were in the show, we really love your work. In my mind, I'm thinking, I was second class citizen mm. just a few hours ago. Mm -hmm. Another thing that doesn't disappear, thank you, because of an election, is culture. Art doesn't just disappear. Writing doesn't disappear. Music doesn't disappear. So it'll continue long after this. In fact, when the Nazis came to uh, France for their occupation of the country, 1940 to 1944, who was still there was an artist named Picasso still created, writers still wrote, and people composed music. So for me, that's an important thing about art. To round out our discussion is the lovely Dr. Kadogo Kennedy, an author, scholar, and professor. And she will talk to us about the historical ramification of race as a social and political construct. So race, one, is not anything biological. We believe it is because that's what we've been taught, but it's not biological at all. It's actually a way of thinking that connects how you look to what you are expected to do in life. And becoming racialized is an immologic process. It's a process that combines images um, along with history, but I want you to remember something that many of us are racist, a lot of us deny that we are racist because we don't want to feel like we're not good people. So know that for persons of African descent in this country in particular, between the ages of 18 and 24, they have the highest unemployment rate and persistently have had the highest unemployment rate. For those of you who are in the system or people you may know who are already DACA recipients, I don't see a problem with renewing your DACA. I really think that there will be a, an avalanche of action, legal and otherwise, for people who have been recipients of this program. And I think if he just walks in and decides to undo all of that, I, I think we're going to have action on a level that we have not seen yet. Never ever claim to be a U.S. citizen. 
either on an I-9 form or otherwise, it is one of the, the most unforgiving things you know, in, in immigration law. It basically disqualifies you from getting immigration benefits. And a few years ago, they started raising uh, the issue as far as people who have been claiming to be US citizens on I-9 forms. Most cases, this would not come up, but a lot of DACA recipients file tax returns and documentation um, showing that they've been employed by large companies. Large companies hold a lot of records, so just please make sure you never ever claim to be a US citizen anywhere. Permanent bars. Permanent bars are, again, another very unforgiving aspect of immigration law. It applies to people who have, after April 1997, been in the US for over one year, left, came back illegally, whether, you were, whether they were caught or not. Permanent bar, permanently barred from receiving certain most immigration benefits in the United States. People who, after April 1997, were deported and returned without lawful, you know, without being inspected. Again, permanently barred. The stateside waiver and a whole lot of all, all these other waivers that we talk about that um, could waive the unlawful presence would not apply to these people unless they stay out of the country for 10 years before they apply for a waiver. A lot of notarios were taken advantage of and having people file documents when they didn't really qualify, sending them out of the country only to be permanently separated from their families. Drug possession, and this is a huge important issue as far as uh, I think we're all concerned in California because on the one hand, we just legalize marijuana, okay? Um, the federal government doesn't see it that way. And for federal immigration purposes, marijuana convictions, marijuana violations are a big deal. Other drugs, same thing. DUIs, I can't tell you how many clients I have who end up in proceedings because of a DUI. Look, I'm not at, you know, I'm not here as a spokesperson for Uber or Lyft or whatever. But just come on. There's really no excuse for it. If you're drinking, just don't drive. Arrests in general, and this is important in the context of I think what we're gonna be talking about, because if you're in a protest, if you're engaged in civil disobedience and you're here without documentation, I think it's it's I'm not going to discourage anyone from doing that, but I think you should think very carefully. Once they start announcing that they're going to start arresting people, you may want to walk away just because the consequences for you, for people you may know who are undocumented, are potentially much higher than the rest of us. I don't want people, especially after January, to get arrested despite our policies of not cooperating, and hope, which hopefully will continue. I don't want anybody to be unnecessarily placed into proceedings for an act of disobedience. We need to go to art exhibits. We need to travel to museums. We need to have friends and create bridges. Exposure in which we begin to unfold the possibility that we are human beings. Think about how we can open the doors of opportunity in our own lives, individual lives. You might not be a CEO, you just a, a person uh, taking the metro to and from school, but did, can you open the door for someone that's following behind you? Can you say please or thank you to someone? These are things that we have control of in our own power that have nothing to do with the hierarchy of government but have everything to do with us as people, as human beings, as citizens of the planet really lead to our implicit thinking that impacts our communication and our behavior. And if we are not aware of that, those outcomes, be they positive or negative, are really attached to the actions, what we do, right? And so in this community, I really want us to think about some things that we can begin to engage as we start healing from the injury. I don't know, I think everybody's starting to realize at this point, we are all a little black. <laughs> we don't have to really allow ourselves to be drugged down this pathway of stereotypes. We can actually reach out to people and start talking to people and reform those perceptions. 
practice inclusion and caring, think about ways to accommodate people who may have um, a different first language, who may have a different cultural, ethnic, um, linguistic background. Can we think about ways to include those persons? And the community of others is really the tool which will strengthen us. And I, and I want to implore all of us to really dig deep down inside of ourselves to begin holding hands with each other and begin walking toward the goal of community and family no matter what we look like.